All right, it's another, oh shoot, what day of the week is this? Thursday, and it's <laughs> Real Monsters yet again. This is S.K. Barrett, your host, joining me, as always, the lovely and talented Wes Hobrick. Say hi, yeah, Wes. The lovely, <laughs> <laughs> the lovely, talented, and stuffed up Wes Hobrick. Yeah. So. I apologize if I sound a little nasally tonight. So if you want to tell Wes to get stuffed, he already is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And joining, a, uh, joining us this week is the fabulous author, Kimber Fountain. Say hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. So happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to have you. Now, Absolutely. we are going to talk about Galveston, and for probably most of the country and the world, Galveston's kind of just a name you heard, uh, you know, in a country song. <laughs> what was his name? <laughs> what was huh, name? Uh, Campbell. Yep. I think the uh, Cam- what was first, first time name? that I heard it yeah. was watching some show on the History Channel, and I couldn't remember what it was, but it was people who were finding all these poker chips on Galveston Bay. Really? Yeah, and that's where I first heard about it. When was that? Oh, Probably a good 15 years ago okay, when yeah. I watched the show. Yeah. I'm not sure when they were finding them. There were there were a couple of different events with that. There were some slot machines that were dumped in the harbor on the northern side of Galveston Islands. And uh, those were recovered um, sometime in the 1970s. And then the poker chips are from the other side of the island, the south side of the island, where the Balinese room used to be, um, because uh, oftentimes when the uh, the club was raided, they would uh, dump the poker chips and liquor bottles into the Gulf, and so oh. they've they've been washing up for decades. Yeah. So they wash up for decades. I don't think anyone's found one in a long time, but interesting. And getting rid of the contraband, as it were. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. That was part of their genius. That was part of their genius. <laughs> All right, so so here we go with our start off our weekly palate cleanser, M of the week. Um, her photo Aww. is coming right up. I took that outside just before the show, specifically for posting it here in the show. Aww. All right, so now, Miss Kimber. Would you mind telling us about yourself and your books? Sure. Um, Well, I'm an author, obviously, based here in Galveston Islands. I've uh, just hit my 10-year anniversary, actually, of living in Galveston. But I am uh, what I call a dirty Gulf baby. Uh, There is a certain portion, a certain portion of the Texas coast where, because of the currents, the silt from the Mississippi washes up right where our shore is. And so... 
a lot of people think it's pollution. It's just silt, you know. But anyway, right. so why well, it's it's a it's a term of endearment, uh, Dirty Gulf Baby. I grew up just south of here, coming to Galveston a lot. I um, graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, and after that, I moved to Chicago and always loved that city even before I'd ever even visited there. And I spent uh, close to a decade there, and then moved back to Texas. Was about to move back to Chicago actually, and uh, just kind of had this hunch to move to Galveston. It wasn't really, there was no logical reason to move here. And uh, so within a year, um, I started doing historical tours and started getting obsessed um, with the history here because for such a small little place and, uh, you know, the city was incorporated in 1839. So it's not a very long history, but there's so much history. I call it the Mary Poppins bag of history because it just keeps coming and coming. And coming <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. even just when you think that you've researched something to death, you find something else that sends you down another rabbit hole. Um, but anyway, and uh, so currently I'm the editor in chief of Galveston Monthly Magazine here on the islands. And I have a uh, released three books on Galveston history, um, all from Arcadia Publishing, uh, the History Press, uh, which is the largest uh, publisher of regional history in the nation. Actually, they do a beautiful job mm. with books. And uh, the first one came out in 2017. It was called the Galveston Seawall Chronicles. And the follow-up was uh, Galveston's Red Light District. Uh, our district here lasted uh, almost 70 years. And then my last, the latest book was called is called The Maceos and the Free State of Galveston. It was released in February of 2020, and we all know what happened the very next month um, after that. And so it's uh, it's been kind of an interesting ride, just uh, letting you know, trying to find other ways to get uh, the word out about this incredible family and their incredible story. So. Oh yeah. And there's a lot there, and just looking at some of the uh, maps and pictures that I uh, included with this, it's just beautiful from what I could see. Well, Galveston um, itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful place, and we have a thriving ecosystem. You know, we had a real problem back in the 70s with the whole DEET fiasco, if you ever oh, yeah. you're familiar with what happened there. Yeah, and so we lost... Um, tens of thousands of pelicans and fish and wildlife. But, you know, after, um, you know, that was rectified, you know, we ju it's just thriving and there's so much, you know, open land that's protected by nonprofit organizations here on the island. And it's, yeah, and, and then it also has the historic beauty, you know, downtown on the uh, northern side of the island in our Strand District. You know, we have buildings that date back to the 1850s, you know, and that's back when they built things right. <laughs> And built them beautifully, and mm. and uh, so uh, and, and, you know, and, and one yeah. one of the things I noticed from the pictures, and they'll and they'll be coming around in the slideshow with, from some of the older towns with the older buildings. There's trees, there's trees on the island. Yes, lots <laughs> of, lots <laughs> of trees. completely yeah. unexpected. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that was, wasn't was accidental, actually. I, and I just um, finished an article for the April edition of the magazine about an organization called the WHPA, uh, the Women's Health Protective Association. And uh, they launched a huge campaign after the Great Storm of 1900 and then the building of the seawall. And then the, the grade was raised as well. And they huge, launched a huge campaign to replant the islands and shipped in tens of thousands of oleanders and oak trees and elm trees and sycamore moors and um and so yeah we have some really old trees are here on the island it's beautiful and not just palms too oaks and and everything yeah. it's great yeah wow it's very lush yeah it's beautiful it's the tree mutt right there yeah. um and yeah it was party gras arch in the background as well <laughs> that's the only remaining one there used to be one on every intersection that's one of the major uh thoroughfares of our mardi gras parades and so I did. So you, so you do Mardi Gras. In, uh, we Galveston. do. Yes. Not just not just uh, it's not just a New Orleans thing. It's not. No, we are. Oh, Lord, no. We're, we are the third largest celebration in the United States. There's interestingly enough, there's a city in Indiana. I don't know which one it is, but they have a huge Mardi Gras celebration. And Galveston is third. It's a huge part of our culture. Yeah. St. Louis does it, too. They okay. have, yeah, they have quite the 
celebration, but being right on the Mississippi, I yes. think it's a big part of it. Well, I have um, Cajun roots, so I just love it. I th- it's a perfect <laughs> melding of my heritage too. And oh yeah, so, yeah. Oh, I have kid. I have those Cajun roots too. I mean, my great grandmother, born in Mansura, Louisiana, and raised in New Orleans. So awesome. All right, let's go. <laughs> Tell me about Galveston. Uh, it's in Texas, I understand. Galveston. It is. It, well, we say that it's near Texas. <laughs> because sometimes... I, I, I wondered about that. How how uh, Texan does Galveston feel? It's not Texan at all. That's really the only reason that I'm here, honestly. Um, like I said, I got out of the state as soon as I could. Nothing against it, really. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a lovely place, and I do, you know, appreciate my roots. But Galveston, just it, it's just different. Um, it's a small town. So I'm sorry. It's a big city in a small town's body. You know, we have a, a bustling downtown. We have a huge art scene, live performance, uh, theater, live music. We have uh, dozens of art galleries and an entire arts and cultural district. Plus, uh, the emphasis on history here is really remarkable um, because we have so much historic architecture remaining, not just residential, but commercial as well. But the city was founded in 1839 and it was founded as an international port of commerce um, because of the advantageous harbor that runs along the northern edge of the islands and uh, quickly grew exponentially really and then hit a bit of a snag when the Civil War started in 1861 of course as did the rest of the nation. Right. But uh, after uh, we were we actually recovered we were one of the uh, fastest recovering cities uh, during restoration, however, and uh, then just took off at lightning speed. The, the reason that Galveston had such a lock is because we were the closest ports to the Midwest and the West by 500 miles. You know, New Orleans is, you know, pretty far. That was the next oh, yeah. closest port. And so we had the grains of the Midwest and the flour and the and the cattle of Chicago and, and all of that coming down to meet. And, and then everything, you know, all the new discoveries being shipped in from the West. And then, of course, um, ex, um, importing as well. And uh, But our largest uh, really cash crop was cotton, of course, and uh, huge cotton port as well. And so by the late 19th century, Galveston was the second wealthiest city in the nation per capita. And oh. second only to Newport, Rhode Island. And that wow. was That's the saying something. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so today, you know, you cruise down Broadway a- Avenue and you see these huge museums, but those weren't built as museums. Those were built as people's homes, you know, oh, and yeah. uh, there was a huge mansion building contest down Broadway Avenue <laughs> at one point. And uh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> and uh, so, but uh, then starting at the turn of the century, you know, after the great storm in 1900, and this was really the premise of my first book, you know, a lot of historians. Uh, you know, you look at the the change, for instance, between um, mansions and museums, and you know, a lot of historians try to explain that shift in Galveston's economy by the, uh, you know, by using the Great Storm of 1900, saying that after that happened, it, you know, uh, nothing was left here, but. Uh, you know, even though it was and still is the deadliest natural disaster in United States history, the people of Galveston just galvanized at an, uh, you know, unprecedented level. And and there was this theme and they called it the spirit of the islands and everyone just kind of pitched in and and did their best to recover from this storm. And man, did they. And there was a, a month after the storm, the uh, port of Galveston shipped out its largest shipment of cotton to date ever than it ever had wow. in the century. Yeah. So it just it, uh, and then came the building of the seawall and the grade raising. And we did that, of course, to prevent anything like the great storm so ever happened. Grade today. raising. I mean, I mean, basically just lifting the town up? Lifted the town. We elevated the southern half of the island by an average of 13 feet. Oh, that's, a, that's uh, substantial. I yeah. have a few photos in there of houses on stilts oh, exactly. after that. Yeah. Yeah. Still considered one of the most monumental feats of civil engineering ever accomplished in the history of the country. It was insane. Uh, yeah. So we built the seawall first and um, it was an L shape and it 
kind of it ran the southern coast of the island and then uh, like hooked around in an L on the eastern portion of the islands. And uh, but then you can't just build a seawall, right? Because then the whole city is in a bowl, basically. Like, look what happened with New Orleans right. and the left. Yep. Couldn't do that. And so um, these ingenious, this ingenious company from um, uh, Germany called Goddard and Bates, they arrived here on the island and developed this crazy. It's just, it's too much to even explain now. But yeah, they uh, yeah. So everybody paid to jack their houses up. And uh, they put their houses on stilts, and then uh, Phil was dredged from the bottom of the harbor and piped in through these dredges with these huge pipes, and just shot into these grade raising districts. And then the, there was about 90% water and 10% fill, and they would let it sit there. They would build levees around each district, and the water would drain, and then the silt would remain. And they did it over and over and over and over and over again. And wow. it took uh, seven years to complete. Wow. Plus, wow. you got a deeper harbor. Exactly, exactly, and that was a huge, that was a, um, that was an icing on the cake, if you will, because we had always wanted to get to the depth of a first class port. We never quite got there, but we always wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, something similar after the great flood of 1993 up here, where uh, people were putting their houses on stilts. We have but. some areas, so I, I'm up in the uh, Seattle area, and we have some rural areas that still are in flood zones, and the and many of the houses have been raised up uh, one story, and uh, in fact, one of the new schools that's just been rebuilt, the entire school school is raised up, with parking oh, wow. underneath of it. Wow. So that's a familiar thing to me. Yep. Nobody's filling it in. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, nobody even thought of filling it in. <laughs> yeah, that is a beautiful old building. I forgot what it was when I was that getting That is that Bishop stuff. Palace, I believe. Okay. It's a different angle that I'm used to seeing them from, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. That's at 14th and Broadway. That was built by a man named Nicholas Clayton. He was one of our premier architects, and uh, one of our, our one of the mansions I was telling you about on Broadway Avenue in that mansion building contest. I'm not sure what that photo is. Now that uh, photo is that is one. Our... It's one that we'll be getting into a little bit later. It's the women of Storyville. Oh, okay. <laughs> in New Orleans. I was like, and I, I guess we, I guess we could just sort of get into that now. It seems to me that Galveston had a much less violent reputation, and if you were to compare it to Deadwood or Tombstone or um, you know, even Storyville. In New Orleans. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and that was a calculated effort. That was not something that just happened either. And that was a big uh How do you mean calculated? Uh, the Maceos, uh, the Maceos were at the center of the what was called the free state of Galveston, which was this era of Galveston where vice was basically our economy. We were Las Vegas before Vegas had even thought about being Vegas. And at the center of it, were two brothers who had immigrated from Sicily. Their names were Salvatore and Rosario Maceo, affectionately known as Sam and Rose. And they grew up in Palermo, which was on the northern coast of Sicily. And it was also a hotbed mm -hmm. of Sicilian mafia activity. That was one of their headquarters. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the families and the, and the different um, uh, sectors lived out in the rural areas. But as far as the commercial kind of center of the Sicilian mafia, all of that took place in Palermo. So the Maceo brothers grew up. Um, amid a backdrop of extortion and extreme violence and all the things that mm -hmm. the mafia it has as their trademarks, right? And uh, But they were they were on the opposite end of that. They weren't part of the mafia. They were part of the peasantry and the lower classes who were the ones being victimized constantly um, right. by the mafia. And so they immigrated along with, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of other Sicilians or tens of thousands and uh, through New Orleans 
in uh, the early 1900s, 1901, and there were two groups of the Maceos actually who came over, and the first in 1901, and they specifically came over to escape that um, that that culture that was happening over in Sicily. Um, but unfortunately, when they arrived in New Orleans, they realized that New Orleans was pretty much the same way because of these kind of, it hadn't been the actual members of the mafia defecting to New Orleans. It had been people that were on the run from them or people who were who were who who knew about their tactics. Right. And so now that they were in a new land with kind of carte blanche, they decided to use those tactics and then basically formed, you know, the New Orleans mafia syndicate eventually. And so the Maceos moved westward to um, Leesville, Louisiana, and then uh, finally Rose Maceo ended up in Galveston in about 1908 or so. And uh, and then um, so they were fleeing that that kind of mindset, you know, that extreme violence. But the thing is, is that they were visionaries and they were entrepreneurs and they were entertainers above anything. And so they also had this kind of very laissez-faire kind of libertarian view of, um, of governments the same way that the Sicilian mafia had, but just without the violent parts, you know? And so point being, they were willing to defy state and federal regulations as far as gambling and, and uh, prostitution and illegal liquor during prohibition and beyond. But they realized that that they could do it in a much better way. And they did it basically by spreading the wealth. By the time Galveston was shut down, uh, there were 42 different gambling houses in Galveston, and only three of those were owned by the Maceos. And so, and, and so when the Maceos made money, everybody made money. And that's really, um, you know, what distinguished their empire apart from even, um, you know, other American mafia syndicates. And now they did do business with the American mafia, but they also managed to keep the mafia off of Galveston Island all at the same time. Wow. So talk about that's like an feat. amazing mm-hmm. level of diplomacy. Yeah. It really is. It kind of reminded me of all the uh, charitable work that Al Capone did, too. You know, serving soup in soup kitchens and giving away quite a bit of his money. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's quite an impressive accomplishment for uh, that family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Because usually, usually you see, you know, oh, we hate how this was done, and then they end up just doing the same shit over again. Yeah, you're right. That does happen. Yeah. That does. But uh, yeah, they, and, and, and again, I don't even know if, obviously it's, it's hard to know if it was even really a conscious thing, you know, if they really knew what they were doing. I'm pretty sure they did, you know, they, but, um, cause they were very innocent about it. You know, when they're, when they, op- after they opened their first gambling club in 1926, which was called the Hollywood Dinner Club. And uh, by the way, the Hollywood was the very first place in the nation where you could get gourmet food, high-end gambling, and high-class entertainment all under one roof. And mm. today, of course, we know that as Las Vegas. But it's a... <laughs> Here's yeah, a picture very... of the Hollywood coming up. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's a ve- it's a very little-known fact, though, that the Maceos actually designed that template that then later in the 1940s was picked up by the American mob mafia and uh, Bugsy Siegel and used to make Vegas into what it is today. Cool. Yeah. There's the Hollywood. So when that club was raided for the first time, you know, Sam released this huge statement about how he was trying to provide the Gulf Coast and Galveston with a premier entertainment destination. And he just couldn't understand why he would be rated, you know, because, and so that's where he was though, mentally, like, who cares if it's illegal? It doesn't matter. It's not hurting anyone. Right. It's just gambling, you know, and, and look at how much, you know, money and, 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 and national fame and recognition, you know, we're garnering from all of this, you know, and not to mention all the oil money from Houston coming down to spend all of their hard earned wares here. <laughs> Which, yeah. that's, this is the front of the Balinese room, by the way, this photo. Okay. That's up right now. Uh, that was uh, the uh, Maceo's, their last and 
kind of their coup de grace. It was, uh, and speaking of, this is a great segue because because the Hollywood Dinner Club had been raided and it was eventually, it was shut down within two years of it opening, but it inspired Sam and Rose to invent a raid-proof club. Huh. And, <laughs> uh, wow. In order to do that, they built a 600-foot pier off the seawall over into and across oh, the Gulf of Mexico. And at the very end of it, there it is right there, it was a tea head. And at the base of the tea was the dining room. And then at the top of the tea were the gambling rooms at the very back. And so at the front of the Balinese, where you saw that original entrance, there was a little foyer and the maitre d' or the hostess who was in there, if law enforcement showed up, she had an alarm bell hardwired to a plate <laughs> and floor and hmm. step on it and it would send the alarm bells off at the back of the gambling room. And all of a sudden, everybody would just spring into motion and there were there were car tables that would be pushed up into the wall like murphy beds they would have billiard tables hmm. that they would put an overlay over uh, to to make it uh, the craft <laughs> table and then they would just lift that overlay off they had trap doors behind the bars where they could drop the liquor down into the gulf of mexico and it took the agents from the time they they crossed the threshold it took them exactly three and a half minutes to get to the back <laughs> that's a long walk all the time that they needed. Yeah. so by the time the texas rangers got to the back everybody would be sipping on soda pop and playing billiards and bridge <laughs> and uh <laughs> so oh, and we're perfect Justin citizens Jr. that's yeah. hilarious that's clever yeah. guys <laughs> very clever. very clever yeah uh, oh. so and uh, it worked actually too. By the way, the uh, the Balinese room was not raided for 15 years, and uh, it finally was raided with the rest of the island in 1957. But there are there is speculation that uh, they had to pay off somebody on the inside because uh, mysteriously the alarm bell never rang that night oh, in 57. Whenever it was, that's yeah, whenever it was raided. So. Yeah, there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of rumor about uh, surrounding that, um, but uh, but Sam and Rose also had already passed away by that point, and they were really the uh, you know they weren't just the patriarchs, they were the you know the foundation, the center of it all, and uh, and they were the ones that really that that wooed the city, you know, not but not um not flamboyantly and not disingenuously. You know, they truly cared for the people of Galveston Island. My favorite story about them is uh there was a a car dealership, this guy who owned a car dealership here and he was about to go under. And Sam Maceo just so happened to decide one day that every church on the island needed a new car for their pastor. And so not only did he buy new cars for the pastors of all the churches on the island, but he also, you know, saved that guy from bankruptcy uh, all in one fell swoop. Holy so, cow. but they, yeah, they Take did a that, lot of Elvis. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. So. Uh, Great story. Mm -hmm. So this, I take it the, the, uh, you know, suit and tight people in uh, Dallas and Houston didn't much care for Galveston then if they kept trying to shut them down and raid them and all this kind of stuff. Oh, no, no, no. On the contrary. On the contrary. Oh. They loved it here. They There was the... Uh, well, the I, I kind of meant official Texas. Oh, than... official Texas. Well... They certainly didn't mind the envelopes full of cash that got sent up to the state capitol um, on a pretty regular occasion. But but yeah, it actually all came down to one guy. I'll tell you that if you want to get into, you know, how at this point about how it all was shut down and um, everyone in the because what was Galveston was doing wasn't just good for Galveston. It was good for the whole state as far as, you know, economically went and as far as our reputation. Sure and such and uh, but there was one yep. guy his name was will wilson and he in the early 50s he was the assistant attorney general to tech of texas and during that position he kind of learned the depth of what was going on here um 
And however, his trepidations about Galveston were not because he was some, you know, moral savior. Uh, he was he was simply convinced that he could use Galveston to catapult his political career. And to understand oh, that. Oh, so yeah. typical. Yeah. Politicians <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and in the 1950s, we were kind of, it was almost, it was very similar to the Victorian era where there was kind of this uptick in morality here um, for a couple of different reasons. One being that women um, had to come back home and they didn't want to leave the wor workforce after World War II. And so there was a huge campaign launched to kind of, you know, um, encourage women to go back into the home and be domestic and such, but also because of the Red Scare and communism, you know, that's when we put in God we trust on the money and we put under God in the Constitution. And so Wilson was kind of capitalizing on this uptick in morality during the 50s. And he thought that if he took down vice in Galveston, that that would make him, you know, this moral champion and uh, kind of, and, and anyway, it worked. Um, and so he was elected and, but the thing is, the reason that you can tell that he had no moral misgiving really about what was going on here was that his entire platform was based on the gambling and the liquor. He didn't once say a single word about Galveston's red light district, which at the time was employing <laughs> over a thousand girls. Oh, you know, what? So, you know, yeah. A thousand girls at a time. I bet he was snorting cocaine in the bathroom through all of it. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. So, Total projection. Yeah. So he was a mess. But anyway, anyway, he, he ended up, he did get reelected, even though there was a, a local or actually a nationwide uh, group that had kind of helped him take down the district eventually. But then they later released a survey that even after the raise of 1957, prostitution hadn't been reduced by half. And gambling hadn't really been reduced at all. It had just gone further underground right. at that point. And uh, but despite that, Wilson was reelected. But he went on uh, to become uh, an assistant attorney general in the administration of one Richard Nixon. And then uh, he was involved in something known as the Sharpstown banking scandal um, shortly after that. And so let's just say he was not really on the right side of history very often. <laughs> yeah. Group. Yeah, uh, I'm still looking for that instance where abolition laws work. Oh, prohibition? Prohibition. Oh, yeah. but they don't. They, they don't. don't. Ever, <laughs> they don't. anywhere. Yeah, they never do. Ever, anywhere. All yeah. All prohibition laws do is um, they eliminate the supply. They do nothing at all to mitigate the demand. And if there's a demand for something, there's always going to be somebody willing to furnish the supply. You well, know, despite I would argue, I would argue there that the supply doesn't even get diminished. No, it just laws. it just yeah. moves into the hands of criminals. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. This, their, the supply routes get restricted, right? But not right. the supply itself. True. Yeah, that's very true. That's a good point. Yeah. But, and I mean, having grown up in the bar and booze business, I can talk pretty confidently about that topic. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm there, from there's Capone probably land, no, obviously. there's probably no region in the country, maybe the world, that doesn't have moonshine stills right now. Oh yeah. I mean, it's a cultural thing, depending upon, you know, how they distill it. For instance, the uh, Polish have a drink where it is uh, potato vodka. They bury it in a glass bottle for a number of years. And then when a uh, son of the local people gets married, yeah. they dig it out and they drink it. Interesting. <laughs> That's hilarious. And depending mm -hmm. upon, we have one of those at the office, and now it's going to bug me which what the name is. For instance, the uh, I'll look while you guys are talking. Well, in in Texas, believe it or not, uh, pro you know prohibition was lifted in 1933, but 
liquor by the drink remained illegal for another 30 years at least. And even then you had to be a member of a club. Like you couldn't just go into a bar and get a cocktail until the 1960s or 70s. That's crazy. Um, here in Texas. Yeah, our, our liquor laws are still outrageous to this day. But so that's another reason why um, the Maceos and the clubs in Galveston were thriving was because liquor by the drink was readily available here. Um, you know, <laughs> right. all the way through, uh, yeah, the late 1950s. Yeah. So. Oh, our laws here are plenty absurd, too. For instance, having to collect cash on delivery whenever we uh, drop beer off. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, you told me yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, and yet and in the, Alabama, uh, they have drive through margarita stands. <laughs> yep. Yep. But they can't, but they also have, they have uh, open container laws, so they have to put a piece of tape over the straw hole. <laughs> So oh, that it's not an open God. container. It's just so silly. But and yet you can just drive up and order a margarita. Well, now, the... well Texans were celebrating because we were able to do that during COVID. I don't know if they lifted it or not. I think they extended it actually, the to go liquor policy for restaurants. Now that was a huge deal here. Everybody was thrilled. <laughs> yep. One of the actual sane things that my state did a few years ago was to get rid of the state liquor stores and allow um, grocery stores to sell liquor. Oh, wow. We still have that division here, too. Yeah, it's been been fabulous. Starka is the name of what I was thinking of. Um, Brown, partly aged in a whiskey vat. But I think the weirdest law that we have here is that when I'm making a sign or a banner that goes up inside a bar or outside a bar on their uh, wall, I am not allowed by law to put the name of that bar on it. Why? Why? I'm they sorry. Say, I'm sorry. I said why about a government regulation. I should. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, it's so stupid. They think that if we add their name to it, it gives them something of value, and that's against the law. But the sign doesn't have value? Apparently that? not to them. <laughs> Oh my you're, God! The government is run by realize, <laughs> Yeah, you have to realize really most is. of the liquor laws up here were written by Capone and the mob. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that. So, what about this red light district? Oh wow, it was uh, it was quite a quite a feat. It uh, lasted, uh, like I said, uh, nearly 70 years. Of and course, it, prostitution is uh, is nothing new. Um, and it existed in Galveston, you know, even far before the existence of an organized district. Um, but uh, like I said, we were founded as that international port. So right. with, uh, you know, ships coming and going from all over the world from different places and, you know, carrying different goods, they, they all had one thing in common, and that was men, right? And, yes. and so began this kind of growth of men who had been cramped together at sea for weeks on cash to spend and board and yeah exactly and so um by the 1880s galveston was home to 569 taverns and bars along with 55 (laughs) different um yeah 55 what they call cribs now this is prior to the district model when women were working out of these little one room shacks or shanties that were called cribs so in a you know in a town that uh you know of at that point probably what 20 30,000 people there were 55 you know different of those just scattered throughout the town but then in the victorian era 
uh, like I kind of touched on a little bit earlier, you know, there was there, you know, that ushered in this very rigid sense of propriety and, and etiquette, especially in regards to women and the expectations for them. And so there was another one of those little upticks in morality, like I mentioned earlier. And so there began this trend in the nation of what was called segregating prostitution because uh, these towns, you know, the Galveston wasn't an anomaly in this case. All right. This was a pretty common scene in most seaport cities and, sure. and urban centers in the nation at the time. And so, um, you know, of course, the word segregation today, you know, refers almost exclusively to race. But this was the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And a segregated district in a town referred specifically to an area where these prostitutes were allowed to operate uh, relatively unfettered. Mm. Now, that didn't mean that prostitution was ever legalized. It very rarely was it was kind of they were working on a de facto um, basis and around the same time that this trend was kind of happening a certain strip of post office street here in Galveston emerged that provided a perfect situation uh, originally this street had been a pretty elite part of town and these huge houses had been built along it yeah. but the cityscape had kind of shifted and downtown had expanded and um, down when downtown expanded they basically moved it like directly in the middle of the residential area. So it fractured the residential zones, you know, and it mm. this kind of wrong side of the track scenario. And so now all these beautiful houses were, um, were kind of thrust over into this area of town that now started to be industrialized. And uh -huh. uh, they started to um, tear down a lot of the other homes around them and build factories and warehouses and lumber yards and scrap yards and things like that. So that meant that these gorgeous homes along post office were now suddenly just worthless as far as real estate value went. And of course, they weren't worthless to the madams, right? These were huge oh, sure. houses, with the, you know, yeah, tons of bedrooms, um, perfect for their female boarding houses, right? Which is all they were doing. Reduced and, prices uh, on the real estate. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Super cheap. And so um, they started to get scooped up and about 1890 is when it kind of all kind of gelled and came together and it was given a name and it was called The Line. And uh, The Line was simple. Was it, it was kind of an ubiquitous nickname. It was given to a lot of different districts around, um, around the nation. Um, and ours just so happened to be a straight line, one shot down Post Office Street, although it did grow and expand, um, uh, starting of course with the free state of Galveston days um, and uh, the entrance of Prohibition which is where all of that started around 1920. And uh, then, um, of course, it peaked during the Great Depression, and that's when it grew and employed close to 1,000 girls at a time. And uh, then continued, of course, during World War II. We had two large um, army bases here on the islands uh, during World War II. And uh, so uh, officially... The district was closed um, via an order of the United States military, but the back doors were always open, of course. And uh, and so and then in the 1950s, it kind of hit another peak um, back when the women, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, who didn't want to lose working income, right. you know, um, started to do this instead. But uh, in the you know, the book was was it was a it was a huge labor of love. It was a, an awesome journey because when I started this, I really didn't even know why I was so fascinated by the, by the existence of Galveston's district. I kind of felt a little nuts, like really Kimber prostitutes, you know, like what, <laughs> you know, I mean, what is your deal? Why are you so obsessed mm -hmm. with them? Um, but, uh, but slowly as I just kept digging and digging, you know, I finally figured out, you know, what was drawing me to this topic and it wasn't, what was going on it was why it was happening ah. and uh because these women there was a man who wrote in the 1930s who wrote his master's thesis on galveston's district and, and it was called a sociological study of a segregated district and um, he discovered that these women were well read they were well traveled they were worldly, they were smart, they wanted to own businesses. One of them wanted to be an aviator. She wanted to be a pilot. You know, these women had huge dreams, but they could make more from one guy than they could from an entire day of menial labor that was available to them in the early 20th century. And uh, these were things like sewing and shelling pecans, you know, that was about right. the extent of it. And even in the 1950s, um, around about where employment started to get a little bit better for women, there was still a very distinct 
ceiling. And it was usually topped out at a teacher, nurse, or secretary. And right, that was exactly. it. And there was you know, no upward mobility within those ranks either. And so, you know, I discovered that there was one thing and one thing only that these women wanted, and that was freedom. And, you know, you know, oftentimes we throw that word around a little nonchalantly and we have a tendency, not we here, but some people have a tendency to think that freedom is something that's given to us, you know, and, and freedom is a birthright. Freedom is something that no matter where you are on this planet, it is something that you're going to yearn for. And it's something that you're going to crave because it's the basis of our existence. And, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what these women were to me. They knew that they deserved to be free and they were willing to do the only thing that would give them that freedom. I mean, these women had charge accounts at local department stores. They had clear titles to automobiles. They had cash to spend. You know, and um, so even though their cage was a, was, you know, it was still a cage because of the, you know, all of the perils of the job, the disease and the unwanted pregnancy and violence, violence yeah. like that. Yeah. But it was a much bigger cage than what most women were allowed to operate within um, during that time. And so that's when, you know, I, I that was that aha moment, you know, for me, I was like, OK, now I get it, you know, because. Um, you know, these women weren't trying to be rebels. They weren't trying to, you know, you know, maybe they were trying to buck the system a little bit, but not, not, not if they had, a, not if they would have had a better option in which to do so, you know, and, um, and right. uh, not surprisingly, it was in the 1960s is when the United States and Galveston both saw a dramatic drop in in prostitution and practically a complete elimination of what I call mass prostitution, which is the district model that uh, is comprised typically of the brothel madam system, you know, and um, that steep drop was, you know, um, not coincidentally due to two huge movements of the 1960s. And the first was the second wave feminist movement um, that was specifically geared towards increasing op employment opportunities for women mm -hmm. and giving them livable wages and upward advancement and mobility and taking the stigma off of women working. Um, but the other one was the sexual revolution um, because the sexual revolution not only took a lot of the stigma off of female sexuality, but it also changed the way men, you know, were viewing women as well, where prior to that, you know, it was very culturally sound to reject women or to ostracize them if they were willing to engage with you sexually. Uh, you know, right. we've all heard those stories, right? You know, yeah. And so, um, but the sexual revolution started to tell men, you know, men started to realize, hey, what if it's a lot better to, that I can actually go and have sex with a consenting peer as opposed to having to go into a brothel and hire a prostitute? Because ironically, that was totally socially acceptable. You know, um, <laughs> you know, all of these districts would not have existed if there hadn't have been a demand for their service as mm -hmm. well, right? you know, as well as them needing. Yep. It. So and that's where that demand came from. And so it, it's just, it was just really a fascinating, you know, when you look at it like that, because, you know, I've studied the feminist movement and, and, uh, the sexual revolution, but never, you know, never thought that, you know, of the, that direct impact that it had on, um, you know, the levels of prostitution in this country. It's really well, you know, Kimber, there's a lot of people in this town who are in this country, I mean, who aren't taught basic economics. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, that's, that's very, fact. very sad. You know, yeah. one of the things I was uh, thinking on while you were talking about that is Daniel Pink in his book Drive talks about the the number one uh, attribute uh, for job satisfaction is autonomy. And wow. yeah. yeah, more than money is autonomy. You know, it's a sense of control over your what you do every day. And yeah. that is, yeah. yeah, and that's exactly that's what thing. these women were after. You're exactly right. That is a great point. You know, they, like I said, they were, you know, they weren't, you know, we have this, 
you know, kind of image of, of these women, I think it's easy to digress into that and thinking that they were all, you know, lower class and, you know, Drug they were addicts and all that kind of working stuff. at in Galveston's district. They would work, they would come here during the summer and they would work for their college tuition and then they would go back and they would go to college. And the thing about Galveston's district too is that, and also the time frame that we're in and the era and the level of technology. And, you know, one thing that Galveston provided these women was complete anonymity. You know, they could mm. come down here and they could work for however long and then go back from where they came and nobody would know the difference, you know? Right. You know, they would the chances of ever people. running into anybody who knew them from that life was pretty close to zero. Exactly. Exactly. Not to mention we didn't broadcast our entire lives on the internet. Like we <laughs> <do these things. laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, it just really... It, it was really eye-opening because, of course, you know, I, I am a proponent of the decriminalization and, and legalization of prostitution. But to be able to find a story that really fleshed that out in historical context, you know, and mm -hmm. really offered the black and white numbers and the situations and and an actual firsthand insight into who these women were and what they were trying to do. I mean, it just kind of, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything, but it just blew the lid off this topic for me. It, you know, it really did because, you know, it's one thing to believe you know, on a political level of, of, you know, in bodily autonomy and, and things like that, but to actually find this seemingly kind of random little space of history, this little microcosm that just totally elucidates, you know, the philosophies that, you know, uh, that many people in the United States, I think, are slowly kind of waking up to, you know, and, and that is, yeah. you know, the thought, the issues of victimless crime, whether or not it's, a, it's, you know, there were no victims in Galveston's red light district. The fact that Galveston went eight consecutive years without one documented rape case um, wow. you know, during the existence of Galveston's district, um, you know, and even the, and what's funny too, is even the historical mindsets of the people, you know, the higher ups, if you will, the city officials, and even the elite people of Galveston who, you know, basically rubber stamped the, you know, the approval for its existence, you know, their, their thought, their thought processes were a lot of what we, you know, who are proponents of, of sex work, you know, kind of think about today. And, and that is, you know, it, um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a necessary evil. That's, that's what, where their words were, you know, um, in that it provided an outlet, you know, for, for certain men who needed that, you know, that kind of outlet, you know, right. and, and also it's, um, you know, for instance, in Galveston, a madam could call the cops, Okay. Yes. If the guy in her brothel that was beating up one of her girls, she could call the police. Right. You know, and um, and and that's the kind of thing too. Today is that you know it's been proven, especially with the European models, that you know that uh, violence against uh, sex workers and sex trafficking just plummets whenever um, there's a, a larger, you know, accept, broader acceptance. Of, of prostitution as a viable occupation for a woman. You know? Yeah, the ability to call the cops is huge. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. Can you? I mean, can you imagine that? That wouldn't happen today. Women can't do that today because right. they will be arrested. You know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so that gives predators just you know free reign. Uh, you know, because there's almost no accountability that whatsoever and and that was really what uh you know drew me to this you know to that issue as well was uh you know these women you know a lot of them were viewed as subhuman mm -hmm. you know they like you know there was just this total loss of dignity <clears throat> that came with this profession and it's part of the reason i wanted to know why women would do this you know at such a large scale but great illustration of that is you know whenever a brothel was raided by law enforcement um, which would happen not just in Galveston, but everywhere, you know, they never arrested the men. It was only the men, the women who were ever arrested uh, when a brothel was raided. And uh, in Galveston's case, there was uh, one instance where a rookie cop was sent to raid a brothel and he didn't know any better. So he arrested two of the men and that were there. And the mayor himself went to the newspaper and demanded that the paper not print the names of the men. Uh, you know, but yeah, but printed all the ones. 
So yeah, it's just it's a complex issue, and again, it was really a, it was a pleasure and um, it was a lot of fun to be able to again illuminate this topic from a documented historic perspective. You know, it's it's a lot. It's really easy to talk about these topics. It's actually it's difficult sometimes to talk about these topics in the nebulousness. You know that is uh, philosophy and and uh, political leanings. So it was really neat to be able to frame it. Hey, Wes. <laughs> I think we lost Wes. I think you did too. <laughs> did he fall asleep? Did I it's him? possible. Oh <laughs> He's taking med- some medications. He might have fallen asleep. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> We did a show last year uh, about um, a, a serial killer in Galveston. Oh yeah, what's this guy? Um, I know. Go ahead. No, you, I forgot his name. It was Durst, <laughs> right? Robert Durst, or is that his name? That that does sound familiar. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. My um, my fiance is actually a total um, expert on crime stuff and. Uh, he knows all that story. I'm not too uh, apprised on that, but it is. Uh, let me look it up real quick. Uh, but yeah, he was crazy. He was not, and, well. And there's a um, there's a really good movie we just watched recently called The Killing Fields. That's about kind of that area. Yeah, Robert Durst. Yeah, yeah. that was him. Yeah, um, crazy, suspected serial killer. Right? They say, but yeah. So, yeah, back in the 80s and early 2000s. Wow. So he was quite the character. Int- uh, definitely worth a look up for anyone who uh, who is interested in that. Did you uncover anything super interesting about him? Uh, you know, we've done so many shows, I can't really keep them all they straight. All kind of run <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that was that was kind of my introduction to Galveston was uh, was that show. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it, I I got to make a trip down there now. Yeah, never, you I've do. I've never been, and now I'm, I'm quite interested to to come visit that part of the country. Well, Galveston's a neat little niche for sure. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely worth a visit. There's so, so much here, and uh, again, like you said, the you know the history is just fascinating, and and uh, it's it's like this little they call it, um, you know, the psychology of isolation. You know, we're we're just a mere oh. two miles from the mainlands, you know, if that's. Um, but there's something about that detachment, you know, that um, really it, it changes the the whole mentality of the people here. And that's, you know, speculated as to one of the reasons why the free state of Galveston, you know, could have lasted 40 years, you know, was mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, that that uh, again, that psychology of isolation, this kind of independence, you know, like. Um, and, and it's funny, interestingly, in the Maceo's case, the same with, uh, you know, it was the same with their home, uh, their native land of Sicily. That was another reason why the mafia, oh, was, uh, yeah, yeah, really percolated there was because right. they were kind of cut off and uh, from the rest of the world, too. And it's uh, so anyway, but it's a it's a pal- it's something that's palpable even today um, yeah. that, uh, you know, you can really just. It just has a totally different energy than uh, than the rest of Texas. It's it's really its own little it's a little odd bird over here floating out in the water. <laughs> so, yeah, but for uh, anyone who's I... interested in my books, they are available at uh, booksbykimber.com, and those are signed copies that come directly from me. And uh, you can Put those order them up again. Yeah, you can order f- directly from you. Directly from me, and then they'll be signed copies. Oh, and, awesome. Yeah. And They're available the, everywhere, but a yeah. uh, little hint, you know, authors do a lot better when we can sell our books directly. That's <laughs> true. Especially with the, uh, you know, publisher like that. I think with self-published, it might be a little easier to to sell on Amazon, but uh, with right. us, yeah, it's 
it's good to buy direct and you'll get them signed. That's awesome. That's yeah. A signed copy yeah. is great. And, um, the, the, the URL for your, uh, site is in the, uh, YouTube description. So awesome. if anybody wants to find it, it's right there. And um, any final thoughts? I don't think so. Okay. This has been uh, this has been an immense pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a lot of fun talking to you guys, and uh, thank you for uh, bringing shedding a little light on our little hidden little paradise over here in texas yeah this has been a treat for us as well uh yeah. really appreciate you coming on and sharing your in-depth knowledge of this uh great little part of the country yeah you guys are great thanks so much for having me sk thank you for being on and maybe uh if you get something else going that you want to talk about reach out and let us know We'll have you on Yeah, again. I sure will. I'll also uh, mention real quick before we go, I forgot, I do have a tour as well, actually, an historical tour. Oh, awesome. Uh, that is, yeah, based off the Red Light District book and the Maceo book, but it is the Red Light District Tours of Galveston. And uh, so just rldtg.com if anyone's ever over in this area wants to see all the buildings up close and personal. It's a pretty fun Definitely. ride. Definitely. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good night.